A statistical model must be identified before we can meaningfully estimate it. However, establishing the identification status of a model can be challenging to do. The bulletproof way of establishing that your model is identified is to simply prove that you can solve the model parameters from known population covariances. However, this is really tedious to do and can be challenging if you have never done it. So for a converter factor analysis model with let's say three factors and uh, se seven indicators each, doing the proof might take like a better part of a day even if you know what you're doing. So that's not very feasible, particularly for more complicated models. In practice, we use two different strategies for identification analysis. One is there are different heuristics and rules and uh, that you can apply. The simplest one is that you check if decrease of freedom is a non-negative number. It must be zero or positive. If it's negative, then you know that the model is not identified for sure. A positive decrease of freedom, on the other hand, does not guarantee identification. So there are these rules. And once you know the rules, then you can develop this kind of like intuition on whether a model is not identified or not. So you start to recognize certain patterns in models that are associated with identification and certain other patterns that are associated with lack of identification. But then there's another set of techniques called these empirical checks. And there are two empirical checks that your software does or that you can check right from the software output, warnings from software, but that's not bulletproof, and missing of extremely large standard errors. That indicates a non-identification. Then there are also techniques that require a bit of programming or a, a bit of, of reanalyzing the data. And I'm going to address two of these empirical checks, estimating the same model from two different starting values. The idea is that if a model is identified, and if you get convergence, then you should get the same result regardless of your starting values. If it's not identified, then you might get different results. So try different starting values. If you get the same result, then you have identification. If you don't, then it's not identified for sure. Another uh, technique is to take the model implied covariance matrix from a set of estimates and use that model implied covariance matrix as your new, uh, new sample and then fit the model to that model implied matrix. If you get the same result, then the model might be identified. If you get a different result, then it's identified, then it's not identified for sure. And then the third strategy is uh, simulating data from a representative model without any of the empirical data. But that's, that's not challenging, but it's kind of a different strategy. So I'll just show these two strategies because they are quick to implement using an empirical data set. So our example model will be this. So we have our two factors, F1 and F2, and there is a bidirectional regression path. So we have F1 to F2, F2 to F1. This is not identified because there's only one latent correlation and we can't estimate two directional paths from just one correlation. And our data comes from UCLA. So this is a, a data set, an example of how you can do exploratory factor analysis using confrontative factor analysis tools. But we'll just be using it to estimate this confrontative factor analysis model. Let's start first with an identified model. So this is a latent regression model, structural regression model. We have F2 predicted by F1. Both are measured with three indicators. And we'll try different starting values and re-estimating from the model implied covariance matrix. You can do different starting values by hand, and, uh, but you can also do it programmatically. I'll do it programmatically because it's uh, kind of like uh, more of my style and also then I don't have to think about what would be feasible starting values. So I'll just use uh, random normal variables. And, and this is the, the original data. And uh, then, then this is the, uh, the identification check. And then this is the, uh, the check for the, uh, the po estimated from the same population. Okay, so, so these are our results and uh, they, they look fine and they look the exact same regardless of which starting values we use. So I, I, I'll just skip the output of that to make the presentation a bit shorter. But let's take a look at how we estimate the same model 
using the, uh, the model implied covariance matrix for the indicators as the population or as a sample. So uh, we do STAT framework in STATA and that gives us uh, the model matrices or it gives us this SCM output in matrix format. And then uh, from the return we get R, the return values, we get sigma, which is the model implied uh, uh, covariances, variance covariance matrix. And then we take the first uh, six rows and first six columns because this is our first observed values, observed indicators, then the latent variables. We are only uh, concerned about the observed indicators here. And uh, then we use SSD to uh, set up summary data. And we use this covariance matrix as our summary data. We set sample size, number of observations to 500. Using a large value here would be preferable, uh, but I'll just set it to 500 because that was my original sample size and I, I put it there just without thinking. So uh, put a large sample instead of 500. And, and then we run the same SCM and then we compare the results. What we will see is, um, this is the, the sigma, they are the variance covariance matrix of the estimates. We will rerun the same thing uh, using uh, the, the implied covariance matrix and we'll see that the results are identical. The only small difference is that these variance estimates differ a, a little tiny bit. The reason here relates to the differences between the sample covariance and the population covariance and how maximum likelihood estimates for variances are slightly biased because of the difference. That's a technicality. Uh, you can get the estimates to be identical to use a large sample cell size in the SSD uh, command put 10,000 or 100,000, it doesn't make a difference for computational speed because you're working with covariances, but it just makes these estimates to be identical. So uh, we can use the model implied covariance matrix from STATA estimates, re-estimate the model using the model implied covariances as data, and uh, those results should be identical if the model is identical. Now, let's take a look at this non-identified model. So it's not identified because we can't estimate a bidirectional path from one covariance. And uh, now we're going to work through the full set of diagnostics. So this is the first, first model, just with our original data. Interestingly, one of the checks for identification is warnings. We get none. So these, these checks are not bulletproof. We do get large covariance, uh, large standard errors, which indicates a, a potential uh, identification issue with the model, but it doesn't really tell us the nature of the identification issue. Let's uh, go and, and proceed with the diagnostics. So we'll first do this uh, uh, loop here. So I will estimate uh, six more models. So the first, first model is, is uh, one, and then models seven, uh, two through seven, six more are using random starting values. I set seed in the beginning of the file to make this reproducible to ensure that I will always get the same results if I rerun this do file. And then I tabulate these models and the likelihoods. What we will see is that we get different sets of estimates for both regression paths depending on the starting values the likelihood of, of these models are the same. It appears to be missing from my slides, but you would, you would see that it's actually identical. And uh, these uh, estimates are also highly correlated. So when one goes up, another one goes down, and uh, that indicates there's a trade-off. So they are correlated over repeated samples. That means that there's an identification issue involving these two parameters. In other words, we know that these parameters together are responsible for the correlation with F1 and F2, but we don't know which one it is. That's the identification problem. All these measurement parameters, the factor loadings and indicator error variances are, are, are identical, so there are no identification issues there. Another way that we can show the lack of identification of this model is to estimate the model from the model implied covariances from the estimates. So, so we do uh, this uh, uh, thing, we, we take the framework, we take the sigma, the model implied correlation matrix or covariance matrix of the indicators, we use that as data using SSD. Uh, we have a large sample size, 
larger than 500 would be better. I just happened to use 500 in the example, and then we re-estimate the model. Then we compare the two models side by side. We can see that the models are, the results are similar, but they are not the same. So you should get the same result. So, so these differ in the third decimal. You should get exactly the same set of estimates. Because we don't, that is an indication of model non-identification. So these are our two simple techniques that you can use. So when you program it once in state or once in R, then you can just reuse your state or R code from one project to the next. And uh, you can also do this with other SCM software, but I just uh, I use these two the most. So this is the R, the empirical checks are different starting values, re-estimating model for model implied covariance matrix. How does this relate to the bigger picture? So these are uh, the list, a number of different ways that uh, a model can uh, not converge, number of different issue reasons for that. And uh, these uh, identification checks are useful for diagnosing uh, model identification or empirical under identification, but not really uh, useful for diagnosing purely computational problems. So for that, for example, inspecting starting values would be more useful.